Um, hello, welcome to our voting rights and suppression webinar. And press next. Uh, we'll start off with some quick introductions. My name is Mireya Chasso. I also go by MJ. I go by she, her, her pronouns. I am the graduate assistant for social justice programs within the SDSJ, and I'm a clinical mental health counseling master student. Hello, uh, my name is Amber Siebert. I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, I serve as the Service and Democratic Engagement Program Coordinator in the Office of Service Learning and Leadership. Um, and I am not a student at UNLV currently, but hold a Master's of Education in Student Affairs and Higher Education. Okay, so before we start, we like to recognize context and pay respect where it's due. So we would like to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral grounds of the new Southern Paiute people. We acknowledge the indigenous people of the lands where UNLV now stands and recognize that there has always been, they have always been places for teaching and learning. I wish to pay respect to the elders, past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge the important role new Southern Paiute people continue to play within the UNLV community. And we also want to offer an acknowledgement of white supremacy for today's uh, webinar. Um, essential to this program is the recognition that white supremacy is ever present in our institutional and cultural assumptions that assign value, morality, goodness, and humanity to the white group while casting people and communities of color as worthless, immoral, bad, and inhuman and undeserving. Drawing from critical race theory, the term white supremacy also refers to a political or socioeconomic system where white people enjoy structural advantages and rights that other racial and ethnic groups do not, both at a collective and an individual level. And the reason that we want to share um, this acknowledgement today is because many of the much of the history of um, voter suppression in this country and voting rights um, has been built on a foundation of white supremacy. Um, yeah. Okay, we'd also like to introduce our individual offices. Like I said, I work from the SDSJ or the Student Diversity and Social Justice Center. Our mission is to uh, advocate with a diverse student population to amplify and affirm student identities through an intersectional framework. We are a student-centered office committed to educating, empowering, and developing UNLV students as leaders to recognize and, ingest, and, and address social injustices. So we do that through a variety of services such as diversity trainings, cultural programming and events, and student groups. And in service learning and leadership, our mission is to create curricular and co-curricular experiences for participants to discover self, learn in community and influence systems while pursuing social justice. Um, a little bit of what we do on campus, we offer um, service programs, which are currently only being offered uh, virtually. We do democratic engagement work, so things like this, voter registration programs. Um, we do leadership programming, we have alternative break trips, which will also be virtual this year um, due to the pandemic. And then we have um, food and housing and security resources for students and oversee a couple of scholarship programs. Okay, so we'll go over the purpose of this presentation. In a nutshell, the purpose of this pr presentation is to empower you with knowledge. Uh, this presentation will focus on the history of voting, uh, history of voting rights, how voters have been suppressed in the past, the current barriers to voting we are facing now, and how to overcome them. Uh, awesome. So awesome. to get us started, um, we'll share a couple of kind of grounding definitions. So the first is voting rights. So um, the U.S. has a long history of only granting the right to vote to certain people. Um, we'll address those first and kind of through a historical timeline. And then we'll talk about voter suppression. So voter suppression is defined as any effort, either legal or illegal, by way of laws, administrative rules, and or tactics that prevents eligible voters from registering to vote or voting. Okay, so to start us off on our timeline of 
or our history of voting rights um, will start in 1776. So at this point, only people who own land can vote. Um, the right to vote during the colonial and revolutionary periods was restricted to property owners, most of whom were white male Protestants over the age of 21. Um, in 1790, the naturalization law was passed. It explicitly stated that only free and white immigrants could become naturalized citizens. Um, and then in 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo ended the Mexican-American War and guaranteed U.S. citizenship to Mexicans who were living in the territories conquered by the U.S. However, um, English language requirements and violent intimidation really limited um, the access to voting rights. And then in 1868, the 14th Amendment was passed. Um, this defined and granted citizenship to all native born Americans, including former slaves. Voters were explicitly defined as male at this point. Um, and although the amendment forbids states from denying any rights of citizenship, voting reg regulation was still left in the hands of the states. And then in 1869, the 15th Amendment is passed. Um, this states that the right to vote cannot be denied by the federal or state governments based on race. Um, however, soon after this, some states began to enact measures such as voting taxes and literacy tests that restricted the ability of African Americans to register to vote. Um, and violence and other intimidation tax were, tactics were also used um, to keep African Americans from registering to vote or from voting if they were registered. Um, in 1876, the Supreme Court ruled that indigenous people or Native Americans are not citizens as defined by the 14th Amendment and cannot vote. A law passed in 1890 allowed Native Americans to apply for citizenship similar to the process of immigrant naturalization. However, it wasn't until the Snyder Act was passed in 1924 when all Native Americans were granted U.S. citizenship. In 1920, the 19th Amendment was ratified, stating that the right to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on the account of sex. It was meant to give women the right to vote, but many women, especially Black women, were shut out of voting in local and federal elections for decades after the amendment was passed. Um, and then in 1961, the 23rd Amendment was passed, which gave citizens of Washington, D.C. the right to vote in presidential elections. However, to this day, um, the district's residents, most of whom are Black, still don't have voting representation in the House of Representatives and the Senate. In 1964, the 24th Amendment is passed. Uh, sorry, I know it on the slide there it says the 15th Amendment, but it's actually the 24th Amendment um, was passed, guaranteeing the right to vote in federal elections would not be denied for failure to pay any tax, finally outlawing poll taxes, uh, which were used as heavy suppression tactic in the South after the passage of the 14th and 15th Amendments. Um, in 1965, we see the passage of the Voting Rights Act. Um, this forbids states from imposing discriminatory restrictions on who could vote and provides mechanisms for the federal government to enforce its provisions. Um, the legislation is passed largely under pressure from protests and marches earlier that summer um, and that year that were challenging Alabama officials who injured and killed people during African American voter registration efforts. Um, this is one of the biggest pieces of legislation that was passed during the civil rights movement. Um, and then in 1971, the 26th Amendment lowered the voting age to 18. Um, this amendment is largely a result of Vietnam War protests, which were demanding a lowering of the voting age on the premise that people who are old enough to be drafted to go to war are old enough to vote. And then in 2002, um, the Help America Vote Act was passed. This was in response to the disputed 2000 uh, presidential election. This was a massive voting reform effort that required states to comply with the federal mandates for um, provisional ballots, disability access, and centralized computerized voting lists. 
um, electronic voting and requirement that first time voters present identification before voting. Um, so this piece of legislation was actually actually huge in providing um, voting rights access for people with disabilities prior to this um, federal legislation did not protect people with disabilities. Um, so a polling place might have not had a ramp that was accessible to folks in wheelchairs or um, might not have had someone who could read your ballot to you if you are low vision or a blind person, for example. Um, so just to revisit our definitions here, we've kind of gone over the history of voting rights and a lot of the legislation that's really influenced um, what we know as voting rights today. Now we're gonna talk about voter suppression and a variety of different voter suppression tactics, both historical and current. Um, and before we get into it, I just wanted to name that black communities, indigenous communities, and people of color communities have been the targets of voter suppression throughout US history. Um, we see this in some of the laws that I was just discussing, such as English language ballot requirements, um, the Supreme Court deciding that Native Americans are not US citizens, and states passing many discriminatory restrictions on who could vote throughout their history. Um, and even one of the founding principles of our election system that we will discuss um, on these slides is the Electoral College, and that was implemented and still exists today as a voter suppression tool. Um, so first historical voter suppression example that we have is poll taxes. Um, so these were implemented in southern states and some western and northern states, including California. Poll taxes were required in many states to register to vote until 1964 when they were outlawed by the 24th Amendment to the Constitution. Poll taxes put an undue burden on black voters, especially former slaves in southern states whose labor was already being underpaid um, with many folks working as sharecroppers. Our next example is literacy tests. Um, so from the 1890s to the 1960s, many Southern states implemented literacy tests, which white voters were largely exempted from for a variety of reasons or excuses that were made um, at the state or local level. These tests were intentionally confusing and were meant to deny the right to vote to uh, anyone who was not white and it largely impacted black voters. And this is an example of a literacy test from the state of Louisiana. It was to be given to anyone who could not prove that they had achieved a fifth grade education. Um, as you can see, just by glancing at some of the question examples that are on here, they're intentionally confusing. Um, the instructions do name that you have 10 minutes to complete the test. And if you have one wrong answer, it denotes that you failed the test. Um, but the questions on the test are, intentionally ambiguous. So um, what one person perceives as the right answer might actually be deemed not the right answer by the person grading the test, um, which is how many of these tests looked and were designed. And then our next example of historical voter suppression um, threats of violence. So Organized white supremacist terrorist organizations like the KKK would show up at the polls and intimidate black voters. This practice was especially common in the South. Um, though it is an example of legal voter suppression, police departments and election commissions did not work to stop this violence as a method to suppress black people from exercising their right to vote. Um, on Bloody Sunday in 1965, during the march from Selma to Montgomery, more than 500 nonviolent marchers were attacked by law enforcement officers. And the purpose of this march was to express the need for African American voting rights. So there are examples that we see of law enforcement engaging in activities that were meant to suppress um, the black vote or meant to suppress black people from organizing around their right to vote. Um, in recent years, we have seen threats of violence at the polls increase with examples of white supremacist organizers showing up to polling places in the South during the 2018 midterms. And um, if you're watching this prior to the general election in 2020, um, that's definitely something that many people around the country are preparing for um, as they are preparing to cast their vote and make a voting plan um, this year. <laughs> 
And we have the electoral college. Um, so at the time that the founders decided on our electoral system, the populations in the north and the south were approximately equal, um, but roughly one third of the people living in the south were enslaved. Um, and because of its considerable non voting enslaved population, that region would have had less clout under a popular vote system. Um, and the ultimate solution to this issue um, that the founders decided on was an indirect method of choosing the president, one that leveraged um, what they had already called the three fifths compromise. Um, this was the bargain that the founders had reached to determine how congressional seats would be decided on. Um, and they made an agreement with folks in the South that an enslaved person would be counted as three fifths of one person, essentially granting more voting power to the white men who were enslaving people during this time. And so the three fifths compromise increased the size of the South's congressional delegation by 42%. So when the time came to agree on a system for choosing the president, um, the founders decided to resort back to this method for the foundation of the Electoral College. Um, and the system that emerged is what we know as the Electoral College. So in present day, of course, every person living in a given state is counted as one person, but the system that dehumanized enslaved people and gave more power to those enslaving them still works to disenfranchise voters across the country by granting more electoral power to more rural and less densely populated states, which are also more white states. Um, and to put a number on this issue, the results of two out of our last five presidential elections, the 2000 election and the 2016 election did not match the popular vote, meaning that more voters cast ballots to elect a candidate that ultimately did not win the election, um, which really kind of exemplifies this issue as something that is suppressing the votes of people of color in this country, um, because it tends to be that our more white states in the country are um, their electoral college votes are kind of the tipping point for um, keeping that popular vote from that popular vote candidate from winning the election. And some more examples of present day um, voter suppression. So one is limited polling locations. Many states offer limited polling locations in densely populated areas. Um, these are also areas where many black people, indigenous people and community or, and people of color are located, leading to long lines and difficulty accessing the polling location. Um, there are strict rules around voting by mail in many states. The, these strict guidelines around when and why you can vote by mail place the burden of voting in person on most people. Um, there's limited early voting. So again, in some states, um, early voting timelines, they vary greatly and many states only offer a few days or a week of early voting, placing the burden of voting on many people on election day. Um, thankfully in Nevada, we do have a two week long early voting period, um, which is great, but we want that for every state across the country. Um, and then purging voter rolls is another example. So in recent years, many states have passed laws that allow them to purge their voter rolls, removing registered voters who maybe didn't cast a ballot in the most recent election. Um, so for example, if you live in a state that does this, maybe you voted in the 2016 election, you haven't moved and you didn't vote in the 2018 midterms, you would need to check your voter registration and make sure that you're still on the voter rolls before the 2020 election, um, which is a tactic of voter suppression because the process to register to vote is more of a process than it needs to be already. Okay, so this is two figures I wanted to demonstrate um, just the context of what voting looks like currently. Um, this first figure demonstrates the number of eligible eligible voters who are registered by race and ethnicity. Um, key things to vote, like take away from this figure is that the number of uh, minority ethnic groups are growing 
not as much as we would like and there's like a disproportion disproportionate uh amount of white voters compared to the ethnic minority voters and with the second figure this is a figure demonstrating the voter turnout so those who actually participated in voting um in the last few elections and from this you can definitely see a difference between Asian and Hispanic communities in voting participation compared to white. And there's also um, a huge decrease from, from the black community in voting from the last election. So those are just some key takeaways from those two figures. Uh, so looking at those, you might be wondering like, why is voter registration so low among like minoritized or marginalized groups or why is voter participation so low? in those groups. Um, and that's because the barriers, barriers and deterrence to voting still exist and affect these communities the most. Uh, a few, the most complicated hurdle being uh, the complicated voter registration process, which is often, uh, like Amber said, more difficult than it needs to be. Uh, with that comes like the proof of citizenship. So this, in the, State. Sorry, I'm reading my notes. Okay, so typically when you register, you're required to show your state issued ID. Um, and if you do not have your state issued ID, you're required to show like some other form or documentation of your citizenship. So that can be your birth certificate, um, your naturalization cards, or Native American tribal documents. Um, but not having these documents is still a big deterrent as well. And obtaining citizenship can be a very daunting process. It also costs a lot of money. It takes a lot of time. Uh, so that's a major deterrent for a lot of uh, people from marginalized communities. But I think a way to overcome this is to help inform those who don't have a state issued ID to let them know that they could still show other forms of identification to show their citizenship, like the birth certificate, the naturalization documents, and the Native American tribal documents. Um, and to encourage them to obtain the necessary citizenship if possible. Um, yeah, so that they're still able to participate. Um, strict voter ID laws. So this is a deterrent that is dependent on polling places. So like at different polling locations, they may require you show your voter ID at your location in order to participate or to cast your vote. And if you don't show your uh, voter ID, you're not allowed to vote. Um, and that can be a deterrent that suppresses your right. And a way to overcome this is to check at your polling locations, the requirements in, or just having your uh, voter ID on you, making sure you're prepared when you go to your location. Um, having a criminal record deters voters from voting as well, convicted felons, currently in prison are ineligible to vote, sometimes per permanently. Although in states like Vermont and Maine, felons never lose that right to vote, even while incarcerated. Uh, keeping in mind that like Maine and Vermont are largely, have a large white population. So it's like kind of questioning why it's only in those two states that they're allowed to have uh, felons vote, but uh, keeping in mind also that if you are on probation, parole, or have a past conviction, you can still vote. Um, and we also wanted to acknowledge with that that we recognize that the black, black community is largely uh, policed and uh, criminalized, and that this affects that community um, a lot more than others. So this is to speak on that as well, that. Um, disenfranchisement of currently or formerly incar incarcerated citizens in nearly every state. Currently incarcerated people are denied the right to vote um, in 16 states and the District of Columbia felons lose their rights to their voting rights only while incarcerated and receive automatic restoration upon release. Uh, in 21 states, felons lose their voting rights during incarceration and for a period of time after. So typically while on parole and or probation, uh, voting rights are automatically restored after this time period. Uh, former felons may also have to pay an outstanding, any outstanding fines, fees, or restitution before their rights are restored as well. 
And then 11 states fell and lose their voting rights indefinitely for some crimes or require a governor's pardon in order for voting rights to be restored, facing an additional waiting period after the completion of sentence or requiring additional action before their voting rights can be restored. So these are kind of detailing like um, if you have a history of conviction, like ways to get around that and that like different states have different requirements for that. Um, yeah, so being aware of those and just, um, I think that's all I have. Yeah, being aware of those. <laughs> Sometimes it lets me click, there we go. So these are some more deterrents or barriers to voting. Uh, language barriers are, um, are a big deterrent because uh, especially for polling locations or uh, ballots or states that only offer ballots for English only, like English only ballots. Uh, so this is a deterrent for non-English speakers. Um, and luckily in Nevada, we do have ballots in different languages. So uh, making sure to request those ahead of time to so that you're able to vote. Uh, voter purging. So Amber spoke a little bit about this already. It's the state the state regularly like cleans out their voters lists and like um, erases vote registered voters who have been inactive or have like duplicate registration records. But this is like largely not policed or monitored and it has been used as a way to suppress voters. Um, so like she said, like making sure that you check your registration for voting before it's time to cast your ballot. Uh, signature match laws. So uh, a number of states are denying people the right to vote because their signature um, on their absentee ballot does not match the signature on their application ballot itself. Um, so making sure when you do register to vote that you take that signature seriously and that um, you're aware of it and you're using like your current name so that um, you can, that it matches the signature that you have on your ballot because those things are being checked and can discredit your vote. Um, and then safety concerns and discrimination. So Amber also spoke about this, that violent threats have been noted in our history and are currently um, on the rise for this election too. So this has been a deterrent for a lot of voters just having a concern for their safety if they are to go to a polling location. Um, but luckily, uh, during the time of this pandemic, we have a lot more options to vote through mail. So we can overcome that by making sure we know the process to cast our ballot through the mail. Okay, so a lot of these barriers, uh, uh, the best way to overcome them um, are basically these three things, having a voter's education. So like just by watching this uh, presentation, doing your research on candidates and knowing your voting rights, um, you're overcoming a lot of the barriers. Being prepared when it comes to um, having a plan to vote, uh, having your registration up to date, being aware of your polling locations, um, having all the necessary materials like your voter ID uh, and advocacy. So speaking up about any of the suppression tactics that we have spoken about and maybe like providing that education for others that who are not able to participate in this presentation or to get the education that they need. Um, and providing the materials like envelopes or stamps uh, to those who don't have that access so that they can cast their vote. Okay. And then um, just some more specifics for overcoming voting barriers. Um, so voter registration, be very diligent about your voter registration status. Check your registration status early. Um, if you haven't checked your registration status and you're watching this before the 2020 election, check it today. Um, update that registration as early as possible. If you've moved since the last election, you need to update your registration. Um, if you didn't vote in the most recent election and you haven't moved, you should check your registration status, even if you registered before. Um, if you did move since last election, you have to update your registration. Um, 
And as a student voter, it is your right to register and vote absentee from your home state if you're not from Nevada, um, or you can register to vote in Nevada, but you have to request an absentee ballot if you want to vote in your home state. Um, absentee ballots are not automatic. They're not automatically sent to anyone. Um, the process is different for every um, state. In 2016, I voted absentee um, in the general election, and I had to send my documents via fax to my home state, um, which was a real process, like finding a fax machine and accessing that and paying for that. Um, but I was able, able to vote absentee because of that process, but it was a more strenuous process than I expected it to be. And so we definitely encourage you to look very early at the requirements for your state um, and get that absentee ballot request in as soon as possible. Um, and then for uh, actually casting your ballot, um, know your rights as an in-person voter. So voter ID laws and regulations vary state to state. So make sure that you know what you need um, when you head to the polling place. It's always good to bring any identification that you have with you, even if your state doesn't require it. Um, in Nevada, you don't need to present a driver's license or state issued ID to vote. Um, you simply need to bring your or provide your name and your date of birth. Um, poll workers in Nevada may ask for your ID. It does simplify the check-in process because they're able to scan your ID, but you are not required to provide it. Um, and poll workers are trained to that effect. And you can vote in, at any in-person polling location in your county here in Clark County, at least. Um, but this isn't true in every place. So make sure that you know the guidance for that. Um, but in Clark County, you don't have to vote at the polling location closest to your home. You can vote at the one closest to UNLV or closest to where you work, um, closest to where your friends live, for example. Um, and then something else to know is if you're voting on election day, stay in line. If you're already in line before the polls close at 7 p.m. or the time is 7 here in Nevada, um, make sure that you stay in line. You're legally entitled to cast your ballot if you are already in line before the polls close. Um, so make sure that you don't get out of that line. And then for voting by mail, um, if you're voting by mail this election, make sure that you look up the guidelines for your state's ballot. Um, here in Nevada, mail ballots have to be postmarked by election day on November 3rd. Um, we recommend mailing your ballot back sooner rather than later, um, or even dropping it off at a ballot drop-off location to make sure that it gets counted. Um, make sure that you know the requirements in your state for uh, submitting your ballot. Some states have mail that the states or the ballot has to be postmarked prior to election day. Um, so make sure that you're aware of that date if that's the case. Um, and then in Nevada, you can also drop off your mail ballot at ballot drop centers across the county that you live in. Um, and here in Clark County for the November 3rd, 2020 election, all polling places on election day will also be ballot drop off sites. So you can drop your ballot off in person. Um, and that's a great way to, to vote your mail ballot, but to hand it off directly instead of like trusting the mail or something like that, if you're nervous about that. Um, so all of those polling places on election day will be ballot drop off sites, but you have to drop them off before the polls close. The polls close at 7 p.m. And um, this one's really important. This goes back to knowing the guidance for your own state here in Nevada. You have to sign your ballot envelope. Um, your ballot has to be returned to the elections department in the ballot envelope. If you lose that envelope, you can get a new one from the elections department. Um, and you also have to sign the ballot envelope. If you don't sign the envelope, your ballot won't be counted. Um, and the signature has to match the one from your voter registration because this is used to verify that you are the one who cast your ballot. So again, make sure that that signature matches. Um, and something else to know if you're voting by mail is only one ballot can be in each ballot envelope. So if you live, say, with your sister and your sister um, lost their ballot envelope, 
you can't share a ballot envelope. Don't put both of your ballots in the same envelope. Neither ballot will be counted in that case. Um, no matter what, just make a plan to vote. No matter how you choose to exercise your right, we just recommend having a plan. Um, so how are you voting? Will you be voting by mail or will you be voting in person? Um, when are you voting? So are you voting early? And if so, when are you voting on election day? If so, at what time of day? Um, make sure that you give yourself plenty of time when you go to cast your ballot. In Clark County, there are a lot fewer polling locations in this 2020 election um, during both early voting and on election day because they um, are mailing everyone a mail ballot this year because of coronavirus. Um, but make sure that you have plenty of time to cast your ballot if you are voting in person. And if you are voting in person, we do recommend voting early. Um, the lines tend to be shorter. It allows you more flexibility to kind of build your schedule around um, or to build your voting plan around your schedule instead of your schedule around voting. Um, so we definitely recommend voting early during that two week um, early voting period instead of waiting until election day. Um, where are you voting? So make a plan for where you're going to vote. Make sure that you know what time that polling location is open and what time it closes. Um, here in Nevada on election day, all polling places are open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And who are you voting with? Um, we can work to hold each other accountable and get out the vote by encouraging friends and family to vote and going together to the polls. It's not fun to wait in line by yourself to vote and there's a lot of strength in numbers. So if you're, this is especially true if you're part of a historically marginalized group or a group whose vote has been systemically suppressed in our country's history, there's a lot of power in showing up to the polls together with a group and making sure that those you love and care about are able to vote in this election. And then some resources for voting. Um, so you can sign up for our TurboVote page. Um, we've partnered with TurboVote to allow folks to register to vote, update their registration, um, receive election reminders, or request a mail or absentee ballot. Um, so we definitely recommend that page if you haven't signed up for it already. And then, um, Know your polling locations and dates so you can find information for Clark County online just by Googling like Clark County polling locations. You can throw in like early voting or election day on there and it'll take you directly to um, the pages. And we're also going to put those up on our UNLV SLL website as well. Um, Nonpartisan presidential election candidate guides can be found um, online. The Campus Election Engagement Project offers candidate guides in both English and Spanish. Um, you can also research uh, candidates, both presidential candidates and down ballot candidates on Ballotpedia. They have an entire page that's only designed for the Nevada ballot. Um, know the guidelines for your mail ballot. So this information is available on the Nevada Secretary of State website. Um, we also shared it here. And if you're looking for that information for another state, again, some Googling will typically help you find um, your state secretary of state's page, which will have those guidelines there. And then lastly, um, the state of Nevada has partnered with an organization called Ballot Tracks um, to allow you to track your mail ballot. So you can go to nevada.ballot, B-A-L-L-O-T, tracks t r a x dot net and sign up for that page using your name um, your date of birth and the zip code where you're registered to vote and it will tell you the status of your mail ballot um, so if you sign up for that site even before your mail ballot is sent it will tell you that there aren't any updates for your ballot but once your ballot is mailed to you um, you will receive an update either via text or email whichever way you sign up for and it'll let you know that your ballot has been mailed and then there will be further updates when you um, vote your mail ballot and you send it back to the elections department okay so being just a single person with one vote, we don't think we can make a difference. We may be thinking at this time, why does it matter? It's out of our hands. We may even be feeling discouraged due to the pandemic, the racial tension, the global climate change. There's other factors in the world that seem out of our control. 
But voting is one thing we can do that is in our control and can make a difference. And that is why I chose this quote uh, from our former Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, change may seem slow, but real change, enduring change, happens one step at a time. And this is our first step. So here are a few more reasons to vote. Um, so these are some additional factors that are impacted or that we can influence by our vote. Our vote can help make decisions and change, make changes to these laws and policies and systems that are just unjust or unfair. Um, so listed here, we have healthcare, like that can be related to insurance laws, Medicaid or Medicare access social justice initiatives to reform law, restructure unjust systems, or to encourage equity and equal access to resources. Um, employment or global climate change. So the US can take part in helping to fight the global climate change. And ultimately, like our vote decides how our tax money is spent. We can also choose to improve education, increase education budgets, or change policy there. These are just a few. There's still like many more factors that are affected by our vote. But hopefully these encourage you to take part. And this is just our thank you message. Thanks for taking part in this presentation and educating yourself. If you have any questions regarding to voter engagement or the SLL office, we provided that email there. As well, if you have any questions related to advocacy or from the SDSJ, you can email us. Um, please email.